I see it's probably about to cut speed. It's probably in the bonus game with a lot of pressure at the time. This is a Tricopter LR, a long range Tricopter that's super awesome. I even got over an hour's flight time on this baby. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, we're gonna start building it. So, what we need, a bag of screws. Unscrew that, just pour it out. You need the longest ones in the, the lock nuts as well. Uh, shove those through the frame here, uh, the bottom, middle and the arm uh, in, in a different order, but uh, you get it. And then you tighten down uh, the things with your fingers. Uh, also, uh, remember to uh, put these on the right side. You want the uh, head to be on the bottom side, otherwise uh, the battery is going to have a bad time. The front arms have a rounded edge to them. They should point forward. Do the same here. Just shove those screws through. Remember to put the screw head on the bottom, otherwise, you know, the battery thing. Do the same with the other arm. I can recommend there's a really cool tool called a nut driver. I don't know who came up with that num name, but uh, bless you. It's like a screwdriver for nuts. Uh, it's really great because you can put the nut inside of the tool and it won't go anywhere. You won't drop it and it just makes it easier. So I think I got this one from Hobby King. It was really cheap. Tighten down these screws pretty hard. I mean, not Hulk strength, but pretty hard. There's no force acting in this direction while in flight. So they don't have to be super hard, but it's better to be safe than sorry. I'm going to hand over to previous David and he's going to show you how to prep the tilt mechanism. All right, let's start with the tilt mechanism. This needs to be able to rotate freely with very little friction. To achieve that, we might need to remove some material because the tolerances are really tight. If you insert the screw, you can feel how tight it is and kind of how much material you need to take away. I use the Maker Knife, which is the best knife in the world, mainly because I helped design it. It's available on MakerKnife.com, yeah! Or you can use sandpaper, up to you. Make sure that you test the fit often. We don't want it to be too floppity flippy. Also, insert the screw and move it back and forth. This is to reduce friction from the tight grip that the holes might have. Or if you have one, you can use a file. Now that everything is moving freely, do the same to the other tilt mechanism as well. Actually, there's only one tilt mechanism in this build. Uh, I might have stolen that footage from the bicopter build video. So, uh, I'm lazy. Mount the tilt mechanism on the back arm using zip ties and make sure that the uh, knots on the zip ties are pointing in opposite direction because uh, that distributes the load better. Take the servo and put the little spacer on it and then uh, put that on the arm. We can shove that into the spline so it stays in place, but there's no need to tighten down the screw because we're going to have to slide this back to make sure that it's centered later on. Ooh, it's time to start with the electronics. First thing we're going to do is uh, start soldering all kinds of cables to the baby PDB here, like the speed controllers and the uh, battery wire. pre in the parts and don't use too high of a temperature Rather, it uses a soldering iron that has a lot of wattage behind it. The baby PDB is made to drive servos. Therefore, it has a really powerful built-in BEC that you can set the output voltage of. In this case, we're going to set it to 6 volts because the servo is going to get the maximum speed and torque at that voltage. Just make a little solder bridge between the middle pin and the 6 volt pin. The baby PDB has back output, uh, current sensor, voltage sensor, and it has pads for all the ESC. So just pretend the lot of it. I'm going to strip off a little extra insulation so I get a lot of surface contact between the pads and the wire. Always pre-tin wires. Make sure that they're saturated all the way through, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. If a cable comes pre tin from the factory, always heat it up and add a lot of your own solder. This is because the solder that they use in the factory is going to be lead free and that melts at a higher temperature so you might get a cold solder joint and when you solder that straight to a pad you might be able to bury it and it looks like it's soldered but it's not. Cut down the length on the ESC wires. One side is going to be 80 millimeters long and the other 60. Make sure that you don't do both ESCs at the same time because you're going to need to cut the black one longer or the red one longer depending on if it's on the left or right side. Oh, a tip by the way, if you're going to buy a pair of calipers, do not buy the cheap kind. These eat up the batteries super quickly because they just drain that little tiny little bit all the time. A really good one does not. The battery lasts for years, but this one just eats it up in like a month. And the batteries are not cheap, so uh, you might save yourself some money in the long run if you keep that for maybe 50 years. Regarding the build video here, uh, make sure that you uh, check the polarity so you solder red to positive and uh, black to negative. I'm going to solder the negative signal wire straight to the ESC negative pad here. The reason why this wire exists is to cancel out EMF noise. You see, when current flows through a wire, it generates an electric field. That electric field can be picked up by another wire that's going parallel to it. 
like in our copters, we draw a lot of current for a really short time that generates a pulse and that can wreak havoc with signal stuff. So if you have a twisted pair of negative and a signal wire that creates loops and those loops alternate in direction. So if a current goes into the wire, it's going to cancel in the next loop. So it leaves a clean signal. Okay, we're going to do the same thing with the other ESE, but make sure that you cut the opposite wire of what you did before. Again, be very careful with the polarity here, because if you connect it to the wrong side, it's gonna just explode. As you can see here, I'm trying to route the cables as efficiently and flat to the board as I can, because it's neat and it also gains me some space for other stuff on the frame later. You will need to cut the negative signal wire a little longer on this side so it reaches across the board. Having a vise to hold down PCBs makes it so much easier to solder, especially wires on it, because otherwise they slide around on the table and it's uh, annoying. This vise is the cheapest one I can find and it works perfect. Another tool I can recommend is tweezers, especially the kind that has a bow to them. It makes it so much easier to get into places and hold down wires while soldering. For the back ESC, cut the wires to roughly 45 millimeters, then strip the wires, tin them as per usual. I can recommend using leaded solder, the 63, 37 or 60, 40. Works great. It penetrates better, it flows better, it's easier to work with, it requires lower temperature. It's just easier to get a good solid connection with. And that's something we want. Now solder the ESC to the pads that are next to the battery connectors, but make sure that they don't short over, otherwise the current sensing is not going to work. Mm, look at that fanciness. We're getting pretty close to uh, connecting everything that we should on the baby PDB. Uh, now let's do the servo power. Some flight controllers have built in BECs into them. Never ever use one of those to power a servo. It might be fine on the bench when there's no load on the servo, but if you get a really hard impact on that servo, it's going to draw a huge amount of current for a very short amount of time and the chips on flight controllers are not made to handle that. They simply explode. So that's why I made this baby PDB specifically made to power servos. Solder the brown wire from the servo onto a negative pad and the red wire onto a BEC pad. We will need to connect the ground wire to the flight controller later so might as well add that now. I just took a leftover piece of the wire that we cut off the ESCs earlier. You can connect this wire to any ground. I just uh, soldered it on top of the ESC outputs here. You're going to need two more wires to connect the battery and the current sensing up to the flight controller. I just used some old servo cable I had laying around. Uh, you need it to be at least four centimeters long-ish. The pads you're going to connect them to is called VBAT and iSense. So just pre-tin the wires and solder them straight to those pads. If you have a flight controller that doesn't have a dedicated current sensing pin, you might as well just skip this step. Ooh, look at that. Now we've uh, soldered all the cables that we need to the uh, baby PDB. So now we can move on to uh, maybe putting the motors on. These low KV Emacs motors are so lightweight and super nice. Uh, just make sure that you use the screws marked as for fourth millimeters Wrong. Even though I don't show it here, I highly recommend using blue Loctite. That keeps the screws from unscrewing from vibrations. It doesn't even take that much extra time anyway, so just throw it on there. These motors are originally designed to use 6 cell LiPos and 5 inch propellers, but we're going to run it on 3 cell and 8 inch propellers, which makes them super efficient. I got over an hour's flight time on a 10 amp 10C battery. Uh, that was a LiPo, but if you run lithium ion batteries, they're uh, 18650s, you could probably get more. On the back motor here, I used the screws that are included with the tilt mechanism. All right, we're getting to the flight controller stage here soon. <laughs> but first, take the nylon standoffs and mount them to the baby PDB. Use the nuts and put them on the top side uh, because we want the board to point down towards the frame. Like how it is. And the flight controller is going to go on top of here. Don't forget to mount the flight controller in the proper orientation. You want the arrow to point forward. I'm going to use one of the four remaining plastic standoffs to just hold the board in place while we're working on it. It just makes stuff a little bit easier. I'm going to start with the servo cables here. And where you should connect those is completely up to the flight controller you use. So look in the manual and some flight controllers doesn't even support servo. So look at that before you buy a flight controller at all. So I'm using the Keku 2 here that we sell on the store. This is the pinata I followed in this video. Uh, it's available on the product page for the 
Kakut, but also for the Tricopter LR. So uh, yeah, in case something changes, always look there because that's going to be the freshest information. The servo I'm using in this build is the custom RC Explorer one. It has a servo feedback wire, which tells the flight controller where the servo is at all times. It's very fancy, but um, not all flight controllers have an analog in you can use for this. What I'm doing now is connecting all the signal wires from the ESCs. I'm cable managing here a bit as well, so optimizing the lengths because I don't want like a rat nest of stuff. I want it to look clean. The order of uh, how these would connect is depending on the flight controller. So check the documentation and make sure that you check it for the tricopter setup. Now we're going to connect the ground wire that we added earlier to the flight controller. You can connect this to any ground on the flight controller if it has many. Also connect the VBAT cable and the iSense cable while you're at it. If you're having trouble getting really clean solder joints, that might be because you're using too high of a temperature or that you're heating the part for too long. You see, there's a thing in the solder called flux, and that's actually the thing that makes solder flow out and bind to other things. If you're heating it for too long, that's gonna burn off, and your solder joint is not gonna be clean and it's not gonna bind well. If you're having that trouble, what you can do is add more fresh solder onto the old solder joint, and that's gonna make it flow out, but remove the heat pretty quickly then, and you should be left with all nice solder joint. If you're left with a little blob on there, that's because you didn't heat it for long enough or you had way too much solder on it. You can remove some of that by wiping off the solder tip and then uh, just before you touch that blob, add a tiny bit of new solder to the tip and then you heat it and pull it away. And that way the solder always flows to the hottest point so it wicks up on the tip and you can pull it away. Looks like I'm adding the receiver now and that's a telemetry enabled receiver. That's why it has four wires. This is a 2.4 gigahertz receiver. I'm not gonna use this for long because the range isn't as long as I need. And also it gets interference from the 1.2 gigahertz video system I'm gonna use. Instead, I'm gonna use an 800 megahertz system, but I didn't have a receiver laying around. So uh, I'm gonna change that later. Most modern FPV cameras come with a little mounting bracket and the Tricopter LR is designed to use those. They're lightweight and they work really well, so why not? I'm putting on a little bit of double-sided sticky tape here and that's because I'm just gonna use one screw to tighten this down. I can recommend using more but I only had one laying around. You can mount the bracket in either the middle plates like I'm doing here or you can mount it in the top plate upside down. The Kakut board has a built-in on-screen display which is really cool so I'm gonna connect the video out of the camera straight to the board and then connect the video transmitter to the output. I'm gonna power the FPV camera straight from the main battery so I'm gonna solder it to the baby PDB on the bottom here. If you're getting lines in the picture it might be because the camera doesn't have enough filtering. So you can add an external filter just to smooth out that voltage. A filter like this is really easy to build. It's just a capacitor and an inductor, also known as a coil. If you don't have one laying around, you can just make your own from like one of those ferrite cores and just wind a lot of uh, wire around it and uh, that's gonna work great too. Mount that filter as close to the video camera as you can and uh, that's gonna filter it the best. You can use a filter like this on the video transmitter as well in case you're still having lines. Actually, you can just connect it to the same filter most probably. I'm now soldering on the video transmitter wiring harness. It's nice to have a connector for the video transmitter because that means you can unplug it while you're on the bench and not blast the whole neighborhood with unnecessary RF and you don't overheat the transmitter which uh, can lead to shorter lifespan. Look at that magnificent beard. Now all cables are attached to the baby PDB and the flight controller. So now we can screw on the little plastic standoffs and mount the top plate. You'll need the two little spacers and two long screws for this. Also the aluminum standoffs. The kit comes with 40 millimeter tall standoffs which gives you a lot of space to install extra gear even underneath the stack. But if you want a nice sleek look you can do 30 millimeter standoffs instead. Attach the back standoffs using the included 6 millimeter screws and then attach the flight controller stack to the top plate using the nylon screws. Since uh, Past David is not working particularly fast here I think I can serenade you with some music. <laughs> I hope I don't get a copyright strike for that. Random question. Why is the bathroom window in a Concord frosted? Like, who's gonna look in? Also, do crabs think that fish can fly? These are the things that keep me up at night. Now screw down the top plate using four six millimeter screws, but make sure that all the wiring are where you want. Like, you can see here that my servo wire was on the outside and I moved it to the inside. Now we're gonna move on with the ESCs. 
don't forget to put the heat trick on now before you solder otherwise you're gonna have a really bad time to make it a little bit easier to judge where you should cut the motor wires I usually zip tie down the wires to the boom and hold down the ESC at the spot where it's going to be mounted later I'm not going to worry about the motor direction at this point because I'm going to use the BLD32 setup program to change the motor direction later but if you don't want to do that you can simply swap two of the wires at any time on the ESCs to make the motor spin the opposite direction so you could not shrink the heat shrink until you can try it later now it's important that you don't mount the ESCs too close to the body here because uh, you're gonna find out in a second uh, actually I can give it away it's because of when you fold the arm it's gonna squeeze the thing I'll show that to you here in 18 seconds a quick tip if you plan on getting a heat gun get one with variable temperature control it's so much nicer because it means that you can use it for like soldering as well like yeah heating up parts and everything without overheating stuff it's just totally worth it to me okay now I'll show you why you should mount the ESC a little bit further out because you can see otherwise the uh, ESC is gonna hit there like the little thingy the little zip tie is just gonna hit the frame and you're not gonna be able to close it properly and also it's good if you twisted the wires there a little bit so they keep out of the way from the folding otherwise like the folding is gonna eat up your cables like look at that it's so bad so yeah just uh, keep that in mind when installing stuff while I'm doing the second arm here I might as well tell a joke a flight is on its way to Sydney when a blonde in economy gets up and moves to the first class section and sits down the flight attendant watches her do this and asks to see her ticket she then tells the blonde that she paid for economy class and she will have to get up and sit in the back the blonde says I'm blonde I'm beautiful I'm going to Sydney I'm staying right here the flight attendant goes to the cockpit and tells the pilot and the co-pilot there's a blonde bimbo sitting in the first class that belongs in economy and she won't move to her seat the co-pilot gets up and walks back to the blonde and tells her you have to move back to your seat in economy the blonde replies I'm a blonde I'm beautiful and I'm going to Sydney I'm staying right here the co-pilot goes back to the pilot and says that you should probably call it in and have the police arrest her when they get there the pilot says oh she's a blonde now oh, okay I'll handle this I'm married to a blonde I speak blonde he goes to the back and whispers something to the blonde she immediately gets up and says I'm sorry and then walks back to her seat in economy and sits down the flight attendant and the co-pilot are amazed and they ask what did you tell her to make her move so easily oh I just told her that first class isn't going to Sydney I did him and so for the back ESC um, all you have to do is solder the wires straight to the ESC you don't have to cut them down or anything because we need a lot of slack there so so that when the servo moves it moves unhindered and also doesn't strain on the wires or uh, fatigue them so uh, just uh, zip tie down the ESC and also put a zip tie on the wires themselves so as not to stress the solder points next I'm gonna do some antenna holders and I'm gonna make those out of zip ties when installing antennas try to make it so one antenna is always visible to you when the other one is blocked it's also a really good idea to make them at 90 degrees to each other so if the copter is banking one of the antennas stays in the same orientation as the transmitter antenna you have on the ground because if you turn an antenna 90 degrees from horizontal to vertical for instance then you're going to lose almost all signal also keep the antennas away from carbon fiber if the tip of the antenna the white exposed part there touches carbon fiber that basically makes that antenna not function also keep your receiver and receiver antennas as far away as you can from the video transmitter and the video transmitter antenna because basically a video transmitter is just shouting as loud as it can and the poor receiver is trying to receive even though it's on a different frequency even if the video transmitter is screaming in a different language there's always some bleed over and the distance between the two is really the key here because if you double the distance between the transmitter and receiver you're only getting one quarter of the interference so as far as you can I found it a good idea to uh, think about where the props are spinning before you install your antennas because uh, I've had to redo mine a couple of times before as for the video transmitter I'm using this little tiny 1.3 gigahertz one it's hundred milliwatt but still you're gonna outfly your 2.4 gigahertz RC link easily with this however I really don't recommend using a higher frequency on your RC link than you do your video link there's two reasons for this the first one is harmonics which are basically echoes at a higher frequency than what you originally transmitted at so on this build I had to put on a low pass filter to get rid of that harmonic otherwise that poor RC receiver would just get flooded and you would get really bad range second reason is that you always want your RC link to be stronger than your video link because it's a lot easier to tell when you're at the edge of the range of your analog video signal 
compared to a digital RC link which can just lock out. Okay, now it's time to head over to the computer and do the initial setup. I'm not gonna cover the software setup in this video. Instead, go and watch the drone and setup guide. There's a link in the description. Then come back here. When you get to the part about the servo setup in that video, there's one extra step that you need to do first. And that is to center the tilt mechanism on the servo. So when the servo is active and sitting at 1500 microseconds in the computer, and pull the servo out of the tilt mechanism, adjust the tilt mechanism so it's pointing upwards, and then slide the servo back in. It might not be possible to get it perfectly straight up. That's okay, just put it in the position where it's leaning the least. Then tighten down the screw so that the servo is pulled in all the way into the splines, and then unscrew it a couple of turns. We don't want any extra friction here, and it should move very easily back and forth. Then mount the servo using zip ties. You will need four of these, two in a loop each. So you have one knot that's on the top of the servo and one knot that's on the bottom of the arm. This way you get a really strong bond. Make sure that the first and second loop point in opposite directions so you get the knot on left side and the right side. This way you distribute the force left and right instead of it being pulled to one side. Now continue setting up the tail as shown in the setup video. The servo setup tool looks a little bit different but it works exactly the same. So if you have it one way up it's going to be in the center. If you flip it over to the other side you should be able to just have it touch that edge and that way you know you got the perfect angle. Now this step you should not skip. It's one of the most important ones in getting your cup to fly well and get good footage and that is to balance the propellers. Don't forget to put the spacer on because it makes the middle hole a precision hole. Props need to be balanced in two ways. The first one, we're going to try and balance it horizontally. Doing this step will ensure that both sides of the propeller weighs the same. As you can see here, one side is heavier than the other, so I'm going to add tape to the light side and this happened to be the exact weight that I needed. Now if I release the prop, it's gonna return to horizontal, but we don't want that. We want it to be able to stick at any angle, which means that it's perfectly balanced in all axes. So we need to balance the hub in this case. Look here when I flip the prop around and release it, it tries to go back to the other side, which means that the hub is heavier on this side than the other. So let's add some hot glue to the light side. Now if I apply the right amount, the prop should be able to stop at any point. As soon as I release it, it should not move. Oh, look at that. First try. It's really worth taking the time to balance the props really good because you're going to get a lot better footage and the copter is going to fly much better. Make sure that you mount the props like in the picture here. And don't forget to check that the motors are spinning in the correct direction as well. All right, done. Now we can go out and do our first flight. If you follow the setup video, you're going to have a really good copter to start with and you can tune it from there. I personally really like how quiet this is compared to a five inch quad and also like the whooshing sound it makes instead of that. <laughs> So uh, anyway, you can uh, fly around uh, a little bit more stealthily and uh, not feel like you're intruding as much. Thank you so much for buying my stuff. It makes a huge difference to me. And I really hope I can give you a good experience in return. So I want your feedback. Go to the RC Explorer forum and share your experience with this copter so I can make stuff that's even better. Uh, thanks so much and uh, subscribe and uh, hit like and uh, share on Facebook and uh, Twitter and stuff. Thanks so much. Ciao. Switch.